Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on August 31st at First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. I'm Pastor Joel. And I'm Natalie. And we're here to read through our daily lectionary texts for today, have a little conversation about it, and see where God leads us. I'm grateful for Natalie being here. I know that uh, this is a time of, of transition in, in her life with kids being back to school and all these things that she's doing. And so I am grateful for the time that we have to read these texts together and to see what God might have for us. So let me open us in a word of prayer. And, and you're going to take the lead on all these, right? I don't know. Anyhow. Not, not gonna, <laughs> let's, not, let's hear what it says let's first. Let's see what it says first, right? <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, we, we, we joke about that from time to time. It's like, who's going to take the lead on these things? But let me go ahead and open this in a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for your word to us again today. We are grateful that you do speak to us, that you are a God who knows us in this specific time and in this specific place. And that through your words, though they are ancient words, they are new and fresh to us today by the power of your Holy Spirit. So I ask, Lord, that you would give Natalie and I uh, insight into uh, what you are saying to us and that we can uh, wrestle with these texts and uh, discover ways that we can be more obedient to what you are calling us to do. We thank you and we praise you. And it is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. So starting off today, um, and again, we, we, I know we talk about this regularly, but the Psalms that we do, they are on a very, uh, almost a weekly cycle. We do midweek connections typically on Wednesdays, so we get similar Psalms uh, quite frequently. Uh, I do want to encourage all of you, um, I think that there's great value in reading the Psalms on a regular basis. Uh, but there are 150 psalms. We don't get to all of them in midweek connections, so uh, do um, do go read the psalms regularly and be saturated in them and see what God would have for us. So, but starting today with Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcasts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars, he gives to all them, all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power, his understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden, he casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Job chapter 14. Then Job answered, A mortal born of woman few of days and full of trouble, comes up like a flower and withers, flees like a shadow and does not last. Do you fix your eyes on such a one? Do you bring me into judgment with you? 
Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one can. Since their days are determined and the number of their months is known to you, and you have appointed the bounds that they cannot pass, look away from them and desist that they may enjoy, like laborers, their days. For there is no hope for a tree that is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its shoots will not cease. Though its root grows old in the earth, and its stump dies in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put forth branches like a young plant. But mortals die and are laid low. Humans expire, and where are they? As water as waters fall from a lake, fail from a lake, and a river wastes away and dries up. So mortals lie down and do not rise again. Until the heavens are no more, they will not awake or be roused out of their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If mortals die, will they live again? All the days of my service I would wait until my release should come. You would call and I would answer you. You would look long for the work of your hands. For then you would not number my steps, you would not keep watch over my sin. My transgression would be sealed up in a bag, and you would cover over my iniquity. But the mountain falls and crumbles away, and the rock is removed from its place. The waters wear away the stones, the torrents wash away the soil of the earth. So you destroy the hope of mortals. You prevail forever against them, and they pass away. You change their countenance and send them away. Their children come to honor, and they do not know it. They are brought low, and it goes unnoticed. They feel only the pain of their own bodies, and mourn only for themselves. Acts chapter 12, verses 18 through 25. When morning came, there was no small commotion among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and could not find him, he examined the guards and ordered them to be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they came to him in a body, and after winning over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for a reconciliation, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat on the platform, and delivered a public address to them. The people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not of a mortal. And immediately, because he had not given the glory to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to advance and gain adherence. Then after completing their mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem and brought with them John, whose other name was Mark. And our gospel reading today is from John chapter 8, starting in verse 47 and going through the end of the chapter. Whoever is from God hears the words of God. The reason you do not hear them is that you are not from God. The Jews answered Jesus, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, Whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me. He of whom you say he is our God, though you do not know him. But I know him. If I would say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Psalm 132. O oh Lord, remember in David's favor all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and bowed to the mighty one of Jacob. 
I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Rise up, O Lord, and go up to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your faithful shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your Turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my decrees that I shall teach them, their sons also forevermore shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will reside, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless its provisions. I will satisfy its poor with bread. Its priests I will clothe with salvation, and its faithful will shout for joy. There I will cause a horn to sprout up for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one. His enemies I will clothe with disgrace, but on him his crown will gleam. And our final psalm today is Psalm 134. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Well, these are the words of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. So I kind of want to ask you a question. So what, what, uh, what themes are you seeing between really the Acts and the John passage and, and how can that possibly relate to the Job passage that we read earlier? Is that no too much? Pressure. Put, no pressure. Is that putting <laughs> you on the that, spot too much? Pressure. Okay. Maybe a bit. Maybe a bit. All right. One thing. One thing I was noticing, and and I think it's related to this idea of glory. Mm-hmm. It's related to who receives or who should get glory. Now the. The Acts passage, to me, is one of those fascinating passages. I remember when I was younger, this image that I have of here is Herod. Herod is the king. This is not the same Herod that was um, king when Jesus was born. This is one of his sons. But nonetheless, later on, he controlled a certain area uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in that place. And, and so uh, the people of Tyre and Sidon come basically begging Herod for food. Herod is in a position of authority. He's in a position of power. Here are people coming to him. He is ruling and reigning. He even speaks so well that they, they, uh, they shout out, you know, he has the voice of a God. He's not, he can't be truly a man because he's got this voice of a God. And, you know, Herod's at the A number one, top of his game, position of privilege, position of power, and God strikes him dead because he did not give glory to God as he should. So it's this little paragraph tucked into Acts where all of these stories are talking about uh, the people of God being imprisoned, the people of God being uh, beaten and exiled, and all of these things where it appears as if they have no power. And then it's compared to Herod, who has all of the power, yet is struck dead because he doesn't give glory to God. Uh, And if you look back at the John passage, um, it's this long conversation that Jesus is having with the people. They are in the temple, obviously. They're in Jerusalem. They are at the seat of of the religious authorities, uh, privilege and power. It's where they... um, offer the sacrifices that God had commanded of them, all of the resources of the nation in terms of their religious uh, expressions and sacrifices and functions are coming through Jerusalem. And here is Jesus in a a conversation with these uh, people in the temple, and he sets himself above Abraham, above the prophets, above all of the things that have come before. And and they they don't like it. Like, what do you mean you will never die? You know, what do you mean? Like, everybody dies. And, and Jesus gives that amazing uh, phrase, uh, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And, you know, the, uh, 
the words used there, I am, obviously harkening back to Exodus, where God gives Moses his name, you know, I am who I am. They recognize that Jesus called himself God, and they pick up stones to throw. So the contrast there between John, where Jesus really is God, Jesus really is the king, Jesus can say anything he wants, but he testifies to God's glory right. and knows that God will glorify him, where Herod assumed an authority that was not his to assume, assumed a power. Right. Interestingly enough, we know that Jesus ultimately does die, that he does lay down his life, um, and then, and then rises from the dead. So there's, there's always going to be an interesting contrast, I think, between the power that rightfully belongs to God and the power that we as humans want to assume for ourselves right. as opposed to being submitted to what God's called us to do. Right. And I, I think what I was thinking as we were reading this, um, I think it plays into that maybe... I think we'll see. All right. Let's just All go right. with this. Go and we'll see. Yeah. So, what I find interesting is um, you have these people in John, and, and they are appalled that Jesus calls himself God and sets himself above Abraham, like you said. And so, they know the stories of old, they know the Old Testament, they know the God who Abraham followed, they know of the mm -hmm. God Abraham followed. Mm -hmm. But do they know God? Jesus is standing right in front of them, and so, and they don't recognize his power. They don't recognize his glory. And so, do they truly know God? They know of God. Right. And it's the same thing, I think, in that Acts passage. Um, you know, they, the voice of a God. So, they know that there's a God. They know that there's this higher power. They know that there's this higher person being, whatever you want to call it. They, they recognize that. Because they something give beyond that, the ordinary. Right, right. So they give this credit, they put this glorification on Herod saying, Oh my goodness, the, the voice of a God, not just a mere mortal. Right. So they know of God, but they don't know God. Mm -hmm. They're not in relation with him because if they were they would recognize that Herod is in fact not God. They would recognize that Jesus was right. in fact God. And so it's like they know of, but they don't know. Right. And I mean, even the demons know who Jesus was. And right. people will pro and they'll proclaim that. And I think that's interesting because there are people that in our world that I think they know of God, mm -hmm. but they don't know God. Right. Well, and then even that verse 24 in Acts, you know, but the word of God continued to advance and gain adherence that when, you know, well, who, who is the one speaking the word of God? Well, the disciples are actually the ones speaking God's word, but it's spoken not out of uh, pomp and ceremony. It's not spoken out of, I'm sitting on my throne and, you know, declaring to you the words of God. No, it's, it's being done in, in places not of privilege, but of poverty, in, 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 uh, in, in places of, of oppression uh, and difficulty. And so I wonder sometimes, like, when, when do you really truly hear God's word? When do you hear it spoken? Um, well, really, when you're in those troubled areas of your life, you right. know, when, when things uh, you know, according and and you know, don't get me wrong. The disciples have times of great celebration and great right. joy, and they have these things. It's not like they're moping around miserable. They're telling the good news. They're telling right. of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're telling that people's sins are forgiven, that they can be healed and forgiven and and welcomed back into community. Um, but the but the powers that be are trying to suppress that, right? Because it would undermine their power. Their power, right? And when I think that is. With the disciples, when they are speaking words of joy and words of peace and words of celebration as they are sitting in jail cells, right. as they are being persecuted right. and they are being pursued, and when they can speak words of celebration and peace and joy, that's only them through God. Right. And and like you said, they're not speaking that to build themselves up. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're building that 
as words of honor and words of glory to God. They're giving glory to God, right. not trying to accumulate glory to themselves. Right. right. Oh, totally. Um, and, you know, I know we haven't even touched on the Job passage yet, but, uh, you know, Job is one of those really difficult books in its entirety. It's a very difficult book, but what I'm, what I'm uh, uh, kind of even impressed by with the Job, some of these images that he talks about, and I know we had a little bit of a conversation out in the hallway and it got a little bit distracting so um but just the idea that uh even even job is aware of of the physical processes on earth i love how he talks about you know water will wear away the mountains and it's just like you know sometimes i think us moderns like to think of people in the past as total rubes like they didn't get how things right. work but he knew about erosion he knew right. about um you know, regrowth. He knew about how a, you know a tree could get cut down, but still, you know, sprouts could come from it. Uh, but that whole connection to humanity. He knows that there's something different about humans. That there's a relationship that humans have with God that is different than you know in, included in creation, but different than creation. Right. Um, and uh, by comparing human's relationship with God in a different way than all of creation shows that Job knows there's something different about that relationship. Um, and at this point, though, I think he's talking, he's, he's recognizing and, and giving God glory because he is the creator of all these things. Right. All of these things are taking place according to God's plans. Um, but the, the, uh, the idea that humans, um, when they die, uh, you know, when they experience dishonor, um, uh, and, and this is where I'm, I'm struggling just a little bit, Natalie, because I think uh, some of what Job is speaking of, I think, is, is experienced by Jesus and is experienced by the disciples as they, uh, as they tell of God's glory. Mm -hmm. It does not instantly turn into everything's going to work out all right. There are still going to be challenges. There are still the questions that we wrestle with, you know, our own mortality, our own struggles and our own sufferings. Um, why does God allow those things? Uh, but even this, this image that a, a stump will put forth branches, and we think about some of the images related to Jesus, you know, where, right. um, you know, Jesus talks about, you know, well, it, you know, he is described as the you know, the shoot that springs from the stump of Jesse. That he is in line with David. Uh, that the God's kingdom is going to be established on earth through even a natural process, but ultimately through that supernatural process of, of God doing what only God can do. Um, yeah, I think it's it's I know it's it's a little bit it's a little bit tough, but um, yeah. God gives us analogies like, like of nature, these analogies in nature, because if we didn't have something that we could tangibly see or see the way that things work, right. I don't think we could get it. Right. And so I think that when he does this and he puts these analogies and then we see it play out like this, I think that's so that we can have some level of comprehension because otherwise it's beyond what right. we could grasp or understand. Like words can't fully describe uh, our, 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 our finite minds cannot right. fully understand the infinite. Um, and the, you know, the final two Psalms that we read, 132 and 134, you know, again, that whole idea of 132, and this is where I was thinking 132 really fits well with the Job mm -hmm. passage. Um, you know, God is the one that is establishing his throne through even broken stumps. Um, right. And uh, life coming out of death, mm -hmm. what seems dark and despairing, God changes into something that glorifies him and actually welcomes us into a more full relationship. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really cool to see all these things interact with one another. I, and, and, and thanks for jumping in there with that crazy discussion with that. But, um, yeah. Well, when we talk about sprouting out and growth, God is a living God. Right. He's not just this inanimate stump. Right. He's more than that. Right. He is growing, living. He is he's alive. 
he's alive. God is alive, yes. He is the, and, and God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And so even that whole idea, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Well, when, when did Abraham actually see Jesus? When did Jesus see Abraham? But you know, Jesus has always existed. Jesus is God. Um, and go back and read Genesis and see if you can find out that instant where Abraham actually does see Jesus. You know, he doesn't use the name, but, but exhibits all of the characteristics, uh, sacrifice, servanthood, uh, uh, death coming to life, all of these things. Abraham saw Jesus. Yeah, because Jesus is God. It's in his very nature to sacrifice himself for us. Hmm. All right, good stuff. We could probably go on and on and on and maybe just keep reading some more and it's just like, it's good stuff. So encouragement to everybody, uh, read your scripture. Uh, ask the Holy Spirit to help you to uh, understand better and, and trust that he will and trust that uh, the Spirit speaks to you as the Spirit, as we believe the Spirit speaks to us. We don't get it all right, you know. We we have our own um, issues in our lives that that trouble our own interpretations of things, and this is why uh, reading Bible in community, reading Bible with other people, and discussing together, the Spirit does work in individuals, but He calls us to be in community together. So continue to do that. Read your Scripture. Get into a good. Uh, discussion group with people, um, worship in church in person if you can, um, and, and experience the blessings that God has for us, uh, not just individually, but in community as well. Well, Natalie, you want to close us in prayer? I'd be happy to. Great. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word to us today, and thank you for, for the gift of the Spirit that we can um, interpret and understand and grow closer to you through your word and through the power of the Spirit. I pray that we come to, to know you and to not just know of you, but to know you and as a living God, a living God who is active um, in each of our lives and that is active in our transformations. And I just pray that um, as we share words in community that we um, share and honor and give glory to you that we may build up the kingdom and um, just want to thank you for this rain and um, continue to send rain um, to nourish our dry land and in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. thanks everybody have a great day bye-bye